Thank you. I'm going to read Hebrews 13, 15. It says here, Through Jesus, therefore let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. We have done many things this week. This moment is for us to offer a sacrifice of praise to our Almighty God who has been gracious and kind to us all our days. Thank you.
God knows, and only God knows the timing, but His timing is perfect. And His time makes all things new. Amen.
everybody is doing okay? Uh, I'm Danny and this gorgeous lady beside me is my, is my one and only, my precious Gerald. My wife, sorry. Uh, I know this is not a marriage retreat, this is not a Valentine's celebration, but uh, a worship service to worship God, amen? So allow me and my wife to welcome, to thank and welcome everyone, especially our friends visiting us today for our service worship today. Uh, we have a lot of friends to welcome and uh, give me give time. Uh, let's welcome uh, Annalisa, wife of Rex. We have uh, Ninita, mother of Andrew. And of, of course, Sian, also niece of Andrew. And first from Jordan, we have Rahab. And uh, our brother Sebastian from US. And of course, we have Pradeep and Jesse. And uh, they're, giving, they're uh, leading us to the communion to remember Jesus. And of course, we have a special brother, of course, our very own special brother Mo from US. So, brother Mo is, uh, is an elder, he's an evangelist, he's leading the church in San Diego and uh, overseeing the whole GCC, ICOC churches in GCC region. And uh, we're so blessed today that uh, God sent him to give us message. Amen. Amen. And of course, sorry. Uh, of course, our very own Jude and Julian who will give the uh, announcement and the response to the message. All right. <laughs> so how's the weather in the yellow and the green team? <laughs> not inviting us next year. <laughs> well, I'm sorry guys, but Bala and I are still in the mood for red. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it was really awesome. And uh, our uh, captain, the team captain, uh, Benjamin, he would like to uh, say thank you to all of you for uh, giving a chance for the oldest to be the champion. And of course, we would like to really, I were really grateful for uh, having last week a blast for the sports fest. Amen. The one thing really have done awesome job. Thank you guys. We are all encouraged. Uh, yeah, that's right. And uh, speaking of encouraged and being encouraged, uh, let me share Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, and uh, New Living Version. It says here, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. So Apostle Paul says that before Jesus came, there's a wall of separation between many people, mm, right. especially for the Jews and Gentiles. And that wall of separation kept them apart from each other. But have you ever think about the possible wall of separation, the possible wall of hostility, prejudice, between among, among us in this room, if not for the gracious work of Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. But the Bible says, but because Jesus the Lord has brought us peace with Him and with His other. Now we are gathering as one people. Right. One people of God. We are not exclusively European, American, or Asian. Right. There's no pride of being black, white, or, or whatever color. Yellow. <laughs> yeah, yellow. Red, yeah. red yellow. Yes. But we are now gathering as one people because Jesus brought us into one body. Amen, bro. Amen. 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 So uh, again, uh, we want to welcome everyone for today's worship service of International Chances of Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.
uh, our Lord, our Father, our King. We praise you, O Lord, for, for today, Father God. You're the Prince of Peace. Yeah. You're the one who gave us true joy, true peace in this world, Father God. Today, we remember our sister Terry, Father God. We really miss her. And uh, thank you, God, for just uh, giving her as a gift for all of us. We pray, God, that uh, today you're going to bring out her, let her shine, Father God, with the spirit in one, with our brother Mo, Father God, as well as, uh, as we, other speakers, Father God. But Father, we pray. I pray, Father God, that help us, God, to keep us together, Father God, in the spirit of peace, Father God. Help us, God, to be reminded, Father God, that our actions, our thoughts, Father God, the things that we are as a whole, Father God, hopefully, Father God, here in, at this time, at this moment, to give glory to your name, Father God. God, thank you, Father God, for, for this afternoon that you are with us. Here, Father God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up. Let's sing this song. And prayerfully as we sing the song, you'll be reminded of the power of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that will open for us that glorious day.
uh, one of the things that I believe very deeply is that communion is a time to not to remember our sins, <coughs> but to remember Jesus. Right. He didn't ask us to remember our sins, did he? He said, do this in remembrance of me. Um, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible uh, is the Son of the Mount, Matthew 5, 6 and 7. But the second most favorite is Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, there's an incredible section of scripture, which I think is so life-changing. God could turn there, Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 3. Yeah, it reads this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, calling it shame, sat down on the right hand of God, the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I love the word in the beginning, therefore. And it's always to, whenever the Bible says therefore, we should always think, why is it there for? What is it there for? Because the author is concluding something that he has said before this. In chapter 11, he discusses men of faith, women of faith. And he discusses how God used men and women incredibly. One of the mistakes we make in that whole chapter is we think that the chapter is about those great people. It isn't. It is really about God using those people. That's why Hebrews 12 author in verse 1 and 2 addresses them as clouds of witness. They're only clouds. David and the kings and all the heroes we supposed to be heroes are just clouds. They are only worth a glance. We're not to fix our eyes on them. They are inspire us, but they don't lead us. It's a mistake we make by thinking that somehow those examples are we to aspire and live after. If you look at all of them, they all failed. Each one of them. Stumbled, fell, struggled, doubted, questioned. Messed up. Each one of them. That's why they are clouds. And that's why Jesus becomes the author and the perfecter. And he's the one we fix our eyes on. So the author is bringing our attention to say, yeah, these are great men and women, but let me tell you where our hearts and minds must remain. And he leads us towards Christ, the author and perfecter. And I think I want to just leave this part to my wife, Jessie, who will kind of tell us why. Uh, um, I know, uh, just as the scripture says, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Right? And, uh, you know, the, the, the passage goes on to say, throw off everything that hinders and all of that. Uh, but it says, fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. You know, uh, Jesus started that. All the clouds of witnesses did it. They followed after Jesus, who is the author, and the perfecter. He is the perfecter of our faith. And for me, I think just getting to know who my author is. Who is the perfecter of my faith? You know, when I was a young Christian, when I studied the Bible, the author so beautiful you know when I heard about Jesus and when I made a decision to follow this great author he was so magnificent to me but then as you get older as a Christian my author has begun to fade 
And now it is just a lot of things around me, the church, the problems, the issues, everything comes into picture. And the author begins to fade. But you see, through history and through great men of the past who studied, uh, you know, quantum physics or, uh, you know, great doctors who looked into the body of man and they said, there is something bigger and greater than everything that we, we know. They stand in awe of this great author. They don't know who it is. Some of them don't even know who they, who they are talking about. But we know that author. Yeah. Right. We know that perfecter. Yeah. You know, but they, our author can fade if we don't fix our eyes. So I would encourage, for me, he began to fade problems and troubles and issues started to fill the face of our author. You know, and I had to really learn how am I going to change that or how am I going to know my author? And it began by, for me, it was just a simple study. I started saying, I need to get to know psychotherapy or counseling or whatever that was, read a few books or in any area of the area that you work in, read, get to know our great author. Because see, as time goes by, we have to renew the face of our author. Amen. And then our author will become brighter and clearer and more radiant the way he should be. Right? So I would encourage you, and this has been my journey for this past couple of uh, years, getting to know who my author is. Mm -hmm. And that has kept renewing my faith. Amen. So I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, to look, re-look at your author's face. Amen. And he, without fail, will perfect you Amen. into his likeness. Awesome. Amen. The word uh, for fixing is interesting, aphorao. And it simply means, in the Greek, it simply means to take your eyes off everything else and have eyes only for Jesus. That's the idea. You can glance at everything else, but your eyes must be fixed on the author. And you know what I just want to conclude on here mainly is the author says, run your race with perseverance. And I love the word for race here. The word for race is agon in the Greek. And which English word does it sound like? Agony. Agony is originally from this word agon. And the scripture uses that we run this race of agony, long race of pain. You and I know, as Christians, if you long, live long as a, as a Christian, you know how agonious it gets. And the Bible is saying that this is not an easy race. Right. This is long, this is tough, filled with struggles and agony. And yet, we run with perseverance. Why? Because Jesus is before us. He ran it perfectly. Not David, not anybody else. But Jesus. And I think that is the call the author is giving us. Where are we fixed? And I love this author. He doesn't say Jesus Christ. He says Jesus. Yeshua. He removes the Christos out of it. He removes the divinity out of him. And just keeps him as a man. As a trailblazer. And he said this is a free man. Had an agonizing race to make. And he finished it so well. And so must we finish it well. With scars, with limbs, <laughs> with wounds, but finishing it. Amen. And I think that's what communion is about. Is remembering who this amazing author and perfecter of faith is. And I pray that this will not be one of those break the bread time, but to really ponder and what kind of race is before us, although it's agonious, 
will make it because he's gone before us and I pray that our example will be Christ and no one else let's pray I pray Lord that as we break bread as we partake in uh, sharing and drinking your blood and remembering your sacrifice Father, we remember how you finished the race and long the is won. It was tough. And yet, God, you are the author who has gone before us, the trailblazer, the example. Uh, and you've done it all and did it so well without complaint, without argument. You submitted yourself to the great will and set such an incredible example for us. I pray, O oh God, that we, as we break bread and drink wine, will truly, truly <coughs> fix our eyes on the one, only one, who is worthy <laughs> and on whom we can fix our eyes on, and nothing else. I pray that, God, it will truly uh, be a life-changing moment for all of us. Not to remember the mess we all get ourselves into, which is true. We do. We are so fallen. But, God, we are so grateful and fortunate that you are before us. Amen. Help us to fix our eyes on you and learn from you as to how you finished this great race. Enable us to finish it well too. Amen. Thank you God once again. Son's name. Amen. Amen.
with me. And this Women's Day, which we're going to have in a few weeks, I want us to keep it as sincere, as authentic, as honest as possible. And so if you're feeling anything like, oh, oh, please, this is God talking to you about, you know, you know, like Jesse was saying, I'm your author, I see you, I hear you. Please tell your friends and your family because somebody on that day will say something that will make another woman feel heard and seen by God. Over the next little while, we're gonna be preparing and I really would ask you, this is our Women's Day, it's not some people organizing it. If you have anything that you want to contribute, anything you want to say, anything you want to share, please come and talk to me after the service because it's it's for us and it's for to show that we still care. Amen. 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 All right, let's stand up, let's sing a song before uh, before Geraldine comes back and talks some more. <laughs> All right, uh, just like what Geraldine is saying, God loves us so much. And it's the story of how beloved we are that impacts people. Let's sing about that. Testify to love.
Kuwait, India, Philippines, wherever you're from, lock up. So I need some help today. I, I'm operating at about 50% energy level. I'm pretty sick, but I'm excited to be here. And I wanted to come and speak because I only get to do this once a year, if even. And in fact, last year, when I was in Dubai, I had to speak by Zoom to you even though I was sitting at Jacob and Bina's house. But here we are together, and I'm really excited to be with you all. Amen, brother. So, so here's why I need some help. I, I am an extrovert. How many of you are extroverts out there? Raise your hand. Well, I only have two extroverts, that's it? All right, how many of you, how many of you are introverts? All right, so, so you introverts, this is really going to be hard for you. Because extroverts, we suck the energy out of you. But because, because I'm only operating at 50%, I need you to give me some energy along the way. Amen, bro. So I, I need a few amens. I need a few amen, bro. And I amen, need, bro. Thank you. I, I need that to give myself to city, San Diego, California. I was born and raised in San Diego. And it has been one of my great privileges to actually lead in the church for 30 years in San Diego. I've actually lived in my house, in my house for 23 years. Isn't that amazing? You know, back in, the, back in the old days, they used to move evangelists every year. And for some reason, I escaped all that. <laughs> but here I come here, and I have so many great friends. It's an honor for me to share the podium with Pradeep and Jesse. We go back to India so many years. They're an amazing couple. And in fact, I love, if, if you do a communion service, model it like that. It's always about Jesus. It's always about focusing on Jesus. True. It's always about the cross of Jesus. Not some story. Right. You can tell a story, but get us back to Jesus. Amen? Right. Right. Yeah. I love Basam and Lama. They, they, Basam's like my brother. He is my brother from another mother. <laughs> I love that. I had the opportunity to be able to spend three days with Basam and Lama at their home in L.A. Wow. And uh, in fact, Basam took me to work. <laughs> and we, we called it Take Your Minister to Work Day. <laughs> but the responsibility this man has yeah, right. is amazing. But he'll tell you, he's very humble, he'll tell you being a disciple is way more important than anything else in the world. Being with Jesus. I, I love seeing my, my brother Benjamin. Uh, he, he was with me in, in Bangalore, India. Just wow. amazing. Uh, uh, like a hundred years ago. <laughs> when, 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 when my hair was black and then she had hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, love, I love seeing Geraldine and Archie. Just uh, heroes uh, to our fellow. Geraldine, uh, I love you. It made me emotional sitting with you at lunch today. How much Terry loved you. I mean, you, you got the, the two Irish girls in India. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. They stood out like a sore thumb, you know, that is white, blue white eyes, and white hair, and, uh, and back in the 1980s, there weren't a lot of white people in India, you know, it's like pretty absolutely amazing. Uh, and then uh, to be with my friends Jacob and being, you know, I, I had the honor of studying the Bible with Jacob, and being able to see him become a Christian in Mumbai, and uh, it's one of my greatest joys to be able to serve with you. Uh, along, along here in the Gulf region. Um, you know, this is my second time to Dubai without terror. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your love. 
Terry taught us all how to die and how to live. She chose the day, she chose the time of her departure. She was so excited uh, on the day of her death from this world because she goes, I get to go see Jesus. Amen. And she was so excited, it blew me away. But she loved all of you very much. The women, she, she loved you guys. Uh, Rahaf is here, where's Rahaf? Are you back here somewhere? Rahaf, and she, she just loved Rahaf and Nuran. Just all of your children, and she was just she just was amazing that way. And so I could go on and share a lot. It's been yes, it's been hard. It's been hard being without Terry. I'm 61 years old. I'm gonna actually make an announcement today that I have not announced in San Diego yet. So please keep it here. I know it's gonna be on video somewhere, but uh, so I actually actually I'm going to retire from the full time ministry this year. Uh, I will turn 62 years old in July. And I will have then have served 40 years in the ministry wow. in some capacity. Awesome. And it's time for me to step back and let the next generation lead. Amen. So I want to correct, uh, I think it was Danny, I do not lead the San Diego church anymore. And I do not oversee the Gulf region. Okay? <laughs> So I am an elder and an evangelist in San Diego, and I support the lead evangelist there, Joe Slippo. And I'm an advisor to the GCC. I don't tell anybody what to do. That's not my role anymore. Because how can I tell you what to do if I don't live here? You don't understand what I'm saying? Right. Now you can ask me questions and we can talk about things, but I can advise you, I can turn you to the scriptures, I can, you know, yes, I have missionary experience, but at the end of the day, I trust the leadership team here to make godly decisions. Amen? Amen. So let's talk about, here's San Diego, and I, I have a short time, so we're going to fly through some slides, okay? Come on, brother. So again, I'm going to... I'm going to do more sharing than preaching today. I hope that's okay. Because I, I want to share some things that are on my heart. What, San Diego is one of the oldest churches in our fellowship. Having started in 1961. The same year I was born. It's been there for 62 years. It started as the Poway Church of Christ. Then it became the Mission Church of Christ. And then it became the San Diego Church of Christ. And last year we changed our name again. And we're just simply called church.sd. Church.sd. You do a search for Church San Diego, we show up at the very top. You know, so it's, it, it's amazing. And, and, not, and not that we're trying to, to hide or do anything. You'll still see San Diego Church of Christ all over the place. But it just makes it a little bit more for our young people they think it's really cool. I could care less. You know what I mean? But our young people think it's really cool, and we're listening to them. But in San Diego, we're working on a few things. Let me see if I can get my, uh, my clicker to work here. This is what we're working on in my region in San Diego. This is our three pillars. We're going to be Christ-centered. We're going to be family-focused. And we're going to be mission-minded. I don't have time to go through the other two, so I'm going to do one with you today. About being Christ-centered. Because that's the first pillar of life that we should live by. Thank you, Pradeep and Jesse. Amen. Exactly. And we didn't even collaborate. How awesome is that? It's the Spirit of God working. I have, like I said, I've been a Christian for 40 years. Two years. Wow. Amen. I've had some really good times, and I've had some very tragic times. But at the end of the day, God has always been with me. Somebody the other night asked me, I've been here since Wednesday. Somebody the other night asked me, Guillermo, Bo, have, did you ever decide or did you ever step away from the church? I said, yes, I did. They said, well, how long? I said, two days. <laughs> I, I was struggling, I was a young disciple, I was in university, and I, I, I just felt it was too hard to be a Christian. 
And I went to university in Boston, but Boston is on one side of the country and San Diego's on the other. So I bought a ticket, a, a plane ticket. I flew five hours. I flew to San Diego. I, I took a taxi to go home. I knocked on my front door. My parents opened the door and they looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And I said, you know, I, I, just, need, I just need a break. And they said, well, well, come on in. I didn't tell them anything. And then I came in, uh, it was nighttime. I went to bed in my room. Uh, everything felt pretty awesome. I got up, I had breakfast. I sat at my kitchen table. I looked out the window onto the street I grew up, and I said, Mo, what are you doing? And later that evening, I said, had dinner with my parents. I said, hey, thank you for having me. I'm going back to Boston. And I got on a plane the next day, so I was in San Diego two days, and I flew back to Boston. I never, ever thought about leaving God since that time. It's because this is what made me understand that no matter what is happening in life, is that I am a disciple of Jesus, and I will focus on Jesus, and I will be Christ-centered. Because what is the opposite of being Christ-centered? Self-centered. Self so you have to decide which are you, because you cannot be both. You're either Christ-centered or you're self-centered. So you want to you learn a few things? All right, so, yeah, cool, it's Christ Center, we're going to talk about that. All right, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him unto his death. Is that how you talk about when you have your quiet time? When you get up and you in the morning, I want to know the power of his resurrection, and I want to participate in his pain and suffering, and I want to be like him in death. That's how Terry lived her life. And it has been a great call. But the chief, the ultimate aim of a Christ-centered life, is to glorify God. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Amen, yes. There are so many things that compete with Jesus for center stage in our life. Amen. Some people center their lives on the quest for success or money. Some people center their lives on their job or their career. Some people center their lives on their hobbies or what they're most passionate about. And then others center their lives on their families and wanting to see their children be successful, that they sacrifice their relationship with God for the sake of their children. These things are not wrong in and of themselves. But whatever we center our lives on can become yeah. our God. Yeah. And as followers of Jesus, if we are not Christ-centered, we will be centered on something else. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Right. So let's be really honest with ourselves today. We've all been through a lot these past few years. COVID, we've lost people. People have lost jobs. People have had to go back to their homes. They've had to struggle along the way. Some people have left the Lord. Some of your friends have left the church. And it hurts when people leave. Are you with me here? Yeah. But some of us have allowed fear to drive us rather than faith in God's promises. Some have settled for the media's truth, social media's truth, rather than God's word as truth. Our times with God have become less consistent. Some of us have stopped serving and volunteering altogether. We need so many more people to help serve in, in the ministry to support the church, even though there are needs all around us. Some have stopped giving contribution or have never even given contribution as our first fruits to God, even though we've sat through hundreds of church services and contribution talks, and yet we don't 
give to the Lord because we're not Christ-centered. We did a survey of our giving in San Diego, and we found that 35% of our members, 35% of our members give zero U.S. dollars for contributions. And you know what? Everybody struggles. But is God going to be your God or is money going to be your God? And you remember that scripture in Mark 12 when Jesus saw the poor widow putting in money. He didn't tell her not to give. Right. He called his disciples over and said, look at this woman. She gave more than anybody else. She gave all. She had little. And yet we struggle with giving to the Lord. I just want to ask you, is it because we're not Christ-centered? And we have our money centered on something else. Some have even given up coming to church altogether. Or we only come when it's convenient. There's a lot more indicators. But let's look at a few statistics that I'm going to show you from the United States. All right, can you hit that right button on my computer in the back? Thank you so much. So this is from the Barna Group. It's, it's the state of all Christian churches in the United States. And if you look at each of the lines, there's a blue, yellow, light blue, and a red line. You guys see all that? Yeah. And so this, these lines represent church attendance by generation. They represent the millennials. How many millennials do we have in here? Those of you born past 1965. <laughs> we, got the Gen, we got the Gen X's, right? Those guys born in the 90s. We got the boomers. I'm a boomer. No boomers. All right. And then we just got what we call the elders. Those are the old people, right? My, my mom is, is the oldest member of the San Diego Church. She's about to turn 96. Wow. And she loves going to church with her son. I pick her up every Sunday. And she just gets in my car. She goes, son, it's so good to see you. Let's go worship God together. I said, hey, my mom. Wow. But what do you notice about every single one of those lines when you go from left to right? They have all gone down. Next slide, please. Now, this is prayer in America. This is, now, this is America. I don't know what's going on here because we don't have the Barna study going on here. This is the practice of prayer in America. And it's on the decline when in 1996, 1996, 20 years ago, 83% of the people in America said they pray at some time during the week. They practice prayer, whatever. They don't even ask how long. Just said, do you pray? And back in 1996, 83%. In 2020, that's dropped down to 69%. People aren't praying anymore. And then the next slide, please. And now, now again, this is Bible reading in America. This is the amount of people who never read their Bibles in the very gray on the right-hand side. And the amount of people who have decreased in their reading of the Bible. And what happened is that it shows that the amount of people who never, never read their Bibles in America has increased from 21% in 1999 to 35%. Over one third of the people in the United States never open their Bibles. No wonder we're in a mess. Because what are they focusing on? Man, I, I, I tell you what, if I, if I could, I'm not sure I would live in the United States for the rest of my life. But at the end of the day, I'm called to be a disciple of Jesus, to be a light in a, in a dark place, and to be the salt of this earth. We need to be the happiest, giving, serving, loving, Christ-centered people in all of Dubai, Abu Dhabi, or wherever you live. Amen? Amen. So we got to ask ourselves, could this be because we, you and I, have become less Christ-centered? Some have given into the world's belief that God is not enough. Do you believe that? No. I don't. 
And some people have begun to really ask, is God's love really enough? Somebody the other day was struggling. I I've had so much tragedy in my life. I'm really doubting God's love for me. You know what? I have not doubted one time God's love for me with Terry's passing. I had to take care of her for four years as her caregiver at home. I would, I would have done it for 40. But at the end of the day, this is what life's about, is making it to heaven and making it to the next generation. So some people think it's God plus the local dream, or in America, the American dream. Some people think it's God plus family, God plus marriage, God plus money, God plus social status, God plus my opinion. Some people are so infatuated with their own opinion of things, and they forget what God's point of view is, and they only want to share their point of view on things. And then we end up drifting towards living a life with self as the center and not God as the center. So we have to ask ourselves, you ask yourself when you go home today, don't do it now, because you'll get way too introspective. Am I Christ-centered? Is Christ the source of my life? Is Jesus the motivation for why I get up in the morning and live my life every day? So how do we get back on track, right? How do we make the change? Well, first thing you got to realize that, well, you know what? Maybe I've slipped. I've slipped. I've gotten self-centered multiple times in my 42 years of being a Christian. And I need to be called back to God. Next slide, please. So let's talk about two things that I want to talk to you about today. Real quick. Again, this is just to give you some things. I'm not going to go very deep into these things. But we need to re-engage our hearts, and we need to realign our priorities to be in line with God's priorities. So in my heart, what I think about, am I grateful to be a Christian? Do I thank God for the blessings? Or do I get more discouraged by the trials as opposed to God just saying, man, you are my son, you are my daughter, I'm going to be with you. Isaiah 43, one of my favorite scriptures. When you go through the water, when you go through the fire, though you will not drown, you will not burn, because I will be with you. He doesn't say you're not going to go through the floods. He doesn't say you're not going to go through the fires. He just says, I'm going to be with you. Think about all the people who make time in their schedule for you. They scheduled you, the people who made time for your children, the time, the energy, the resources that have been poured out for you and your family. We should, we should, like I say, you have to. This is me, I should feel a sense of gratitude and thankfulness for all that God has done for me. And I would like for you to consider becoming people who are grateful versus people who are complaining. Amen? Amen. And then realigning our priorities with God's priority. So what do you look at when you look at your priorities? I have to look at my schedule. And I have to look at where I spend my money. Those are the two things I look at when it comes to uh, my aligning my priorities with God. Am I giving my time to God? And am I giving my money to God? So in the United States, I have my three biggest budget items that I have. You know what number one is the thing I spend the most on? What would you guess? Taxes. <laughs> Paying the U.S. government. <laughs> what was that? You cannot relate. You can't relate. You don't pay taxes here, do you? Yeah. Thank God. But that's what I have to do. I have to pay taxes. I have to pay income tax. I have to pay sales tax. I have to pay property tax. I have to pay tax every time I get on an airplane. 
I gotta pay tax to live in my house. I gotta pay tax for my gasoline. I gotta be—I don't have to pay tax for my food. Praise God. <laughs> and I figured it out that I pay about forty percent of my income to the government for tax. Forty percent. Now, I don't have a choice for that. Well, I, I guess I could. I guess I could move here, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Second thing is my housing. My housing takes about 27% of my income. Third thing, tithing. Yeah. I, I love that. I love giving to God. And if the Bible says we should give a tenth, I say, I, I want to give more. Now, I'm not saying, wow, Guillermo, you're awesome. I'm just saying I've been doing this for a long time. That's all I'm saying. But I want to see God be glorified with the money that I make. Because why? Who gives me the ability to create wealth? Well, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Bible says God gives you the ability to create wealth. So I better give to God because he can also take that away, that ability away. You know what I mean? Now, I don't do it because I'm afraid. I do it because I'm grateful. That's why we give. You know, it costs money to meet here. It costs yeah. money to have snacks out there. It costs money to put on a women's day. Yeah. And if you're not giving, you're just relying on the person sitting next to you to help fund all of that. Right. So I just want to encourage you. Yeah, just want to talk. Amazing. Next slide, please. We're almost done. Next slide. This is my second scripture. I'm going to have two scriptures today. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And he is the head of the body. Who's he? Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Just want to make sure you guys are with me, right? <laughs> he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the, dead, among the dead. So that in everything, he might have what? What does that mean? He's on top. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters. I'm really proud of you guys. I share about you guys all the time. I, I, I pray for you all, every single day. I really do. You're on a little sticky note on my computer monitor, one of those post-it notes, and it has the Gulf region. And I pray for you guys every day. Because I think you guys are amazing. And you encourage me to keep my faith going. Now, it's ultimately, as Pradeep and Jesse said, it's God. But we help each other along the way. So... A couple things I want to share in San Diego. Last year, we saw a need in our family in San Diego to strengthen our young married couples. So many young married couples were coming along. So we asked one of our older marrieds to say, hey, listen, would you be willing to step away from your leadership position and just work with our young married couples? And they said yes. And we said, we're going to help you provide you with training materials. We're going to get you trained. We're going to give you the tools so that these couples are getting an incredible early help in their marriages. And it's so invaluable. We're so grateful to Gus and Sonia Maya. They're Mexican. And, and their hearts that they found their, in their schedule to serve this way. We need people like that to serve. They're not full-time ministry. They're just serving. We've also seen an amazing witness to God to strengthen all the disciples in our region of San Diego. And so myself and Sylvia Mendez, Sylvia's husband, Luis, passed away in 2019. We have been called to train the shepherds in our region. Because I want our evangelist and women's ministry leader to focus on leading the church. And so we put out a call and we had eight mature couples said we would like to be trained how to be a shepherding couple. And then I have a training program that I have gone through, Sylvia and I have gone through with them. And then we study case studies together and we study real life situations together. And we look at what we would do and then we help one another because we've had some very serious situations in our congregation. We've had some of our members wanting to transition from one sex to another. How do you deal with that, right? 
We've had just recently a suicide in our membership where a brother, 61 years old, took his life, left his wife and his three children. And we don't even know why. But we felt, boy, we need to start having the shepherding ministry so that everyone has an opportunity to be able to be heard. These are the examples of how God is calling us back to be more Christ-centered. So I'd like for us to dream together as I finish. Imagine what if every member here lived a life that was Christ-centered. Imagine that. How, with the joy level, the excitement, the, the learning from one another, from the scriptures, the praying for one another. I mean, we would be such a light that we, we could have, I mean, we're already busting out of this place here. We, we would fill big conference center halls with the people, because they would like, what do you have? I want that. Followers who start to become like him. They talk like Jesus. They think like Jesus. They dream about Jesus. They create space and spend more time with Jesus. And things that are important to Jesus are important to them. We dream of a church that chooses to obey his commands out of love and honor for their Lord, not from fear of being caught in sin. That is our dream. We dream of a church whose greatest desire is to please him and to grow to be more like him. We dream of a church where things that are important to God are important to all the members of the church. And we dream of a church that joyfully serves out others out of the overflowing of gratitude from our hearts. What do you dream about in your church? And we're laying this out, and you should see the excitement of, of what's going on. Slide, next slide. So my premise is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. I love that about Pradeep and Jesse. It's about God. Yeah. Don't add all the other stuff in there. Jesus has to be Christ-centered. God's love is enough for us. Christ is the center of our life. Then Christ will be enough for us. So we're doing new Christian classes. We're doing shepherding training classes. We're training our family group leaders. Met leaders. We're having each member take a personal responsibility for their spiritual health and walk with God. And we have different tools that we're helping them each out with. Last slide. You guys recognize that painting? Yeah. Anybody know that's a, what the name of that painting is? Starry Night, right? Remember, remember who the painter is? Vincent Van Gogh. Love it. You know how much that painting's worth? 440 you buy euros, 440 million. That's an estimate. It's really priceless because no one's ever sold it. It's sitting at the, you know, the, the natural or the museum of, of something I forgot in New York City somewhere. But they're not going to sell it. But one of the last paintings for Vincent Van Gogh went for 100 million, about 363 million. So we're figuring, hey, this one's worth at least 440 because it's so famous. But think about this for a second. Imagine you have this painting in your house. And it is so beautiful that you decide not only to rearrange your furniture, but you decide to reorder your entire house. <laughs> you decide to knock down walls. You decide to change the direction of where the couch is facing. Where's the couch facing right now? And my house is towards the TV, right? <laughs> you take down that TV and you put this painting there. Because you want it to be the center. Actually, I wouldn't put it on my wall, believe me. But let's just say. But it's not just the focal point of the room. I want when somebody walks in, wherever they go in my house, they can see that painting. And I believe this is what someone's life would look like if Jesus is at the center. This is what it's like to live a Christ-centered life. I want to encourage us as I close out here. Let's turn away from sin. And let's turn towards the cross of Jesus. Let's look at Jesus' beauty, Jesus' glory, Jesus' compassion, Jesus' worth, Jesus' grace, Jesus' mercy, Jesus' forgiveness, Jesus' sacrifice for you and I.
And look at all he's done for us on the cross. And let's recommit, realign, reignite our passion as disciples of Jesus. Actually, I lied. It. There's one more slide after that. I didn't lie. I was just mistaken. Let us all be Christ-centered. Love you guys very much. Thank you for having me. All right. Wow. What amazing service, everybody. You know, starting from the welcome from uh, Danny and Sonia, reminding us that we are gathered as a body that because Christ broke down the wall of facility that separated us. Then that amazing communion from Pradeep and Jesse. Thank you very much. That uh, you have reminded us that we have to fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. And if we are cold right now, we have to re-get to know our author. And an amazing and special thanks to Mo for that, uh, for that message. I don't have words to describe it right now. Uh, it's truly amazing because we live in a country, we live in a city, Dubai, where in everything is always getting better, where nothing is ever enough, yeah. where in everything should be centered upon yourself and your success on what you want. But in here, right now, we've just heard this message that we should put all of that aside, put all of that away, and focus ourselves to God. Amen. Wow. There's just no words. I'm just amazed because, especially being in a university right now, I can uh, relate to what Mo said earlier. There are things that's going to be hard. There's things that you just want to focus on yourself. But right now, I've been reminded to focus on God. And I hope everybody has been reminded today that we must focus our life on God, the perfecter of our faith. Wow. The synergy that we have had today in the service, it truly was amazing. And let's just give them another warm round of applause. Uh, yeah. So, once again, thank you very much. And for our announcements for today, please note that the recording of this worship service will be available on the ICOC UAE channel on YouTube for those who could not attend this evening. We are back in this hall for the next worship service together on the February 12th at 4 p.m. And let us reach out to those who are keen on seeking God to worship with us. And if you are visiting us with this evening, please do join us for our midweek meetings that happens on Tuesdays or Wednesdays, depending on the area that you guys stay in. And this midweek, the women will have an online meeting on Wednesday, February 8th at 8 p.m. February 15, sorry, February 15 at 8 p.m. And men can plan your meeting accordingly in your family groups. Then the singles will have an acoustic night on Saturday at Feb 18 at the Voice International Studio 307 on the third floor from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And feel free to invite your single friends to the event. And women, as Geraldine had said earlier, mark your calendars for the for March 5th for that very special Women's Day. Come on. And we will have a fan golf midweek series by Mark Templer for six weeks over March and April on Tuesday, starting March 14. The series will be titled Tears of the Father. Tidy mark your calendars from March 14, 21, and 28 and April 4, 18, and the 25th. And Kids Kingdom, parents, please check your check with your individual KKC coordinators for the plan ahead of the KKC weekly classes. And um, yes, we would like to appeal to all the parents that and disciples to volunteer this year for the Kids Kingdom for the best three quarters. Kindly inform Cliff and Rowie of your in, if you're interested in serving God. And regularly, monthly contributions can be handed into your respective finance representative or your Bible talk leaders. And lastly, please continue to pray for each other, for those who seek God, and for world peace. And before we end the service, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty Father God, we are so grateful that we have gathered here today as one body. Because you have, set, you have broken down the walls that have separated us, Father. We are grateful that we have gotten to know you, Father. But help our hearts 
to keep on knowing you, Father, to be keen on knowing you and seeking you every single day of our lives, Father. Mm -hmm. Father, we live in this world, we live in this city where everything else can be our focus, where everything else, and especially ourselves, can be our can be the focus of our lives. Mm -hmm. But Father, from one thing that we have learned today, we know that you should be our focus in our lives. Mm -hmm. You sh our life should be centered on you and only you, Father. Because when we have nothing and you, Father, we have everything, Father. Because we have learned today that Jesus, the man, is enough for us, Father. We are so grateful, Father, for all the people who have talked today, who have spoken today, and who have reminded us of all these things, Father. May you bless them and bless their hearts, Father. And I pray, Father, for all those people as well who have come here today, that uh, from whatever they have heard today, that they may take it in the, into their hearts, into their mind, and into their spirit, and practice it, Father. We love you with all our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 May the Lord shine down His light on us.